everyone, I'm the Blood Guy. Welcome back to another review of a serial killer documentary. And this is yet another to be original. Uh, it's also one about a killer that I've talked about almost ad nauseum. I've reviewed a ton of stuff on this guy. Uh, there are a few more to be originals that I'll be getting to. And if it's, one thing I noticed is after watching this one, because I think this is the third to be original serial killer documentary I've watched, I'm kind of seeing the pattern of... Uh, sort of the angle that they're going for, how they're presented, and just kind of seeing how the only thing that really changes is kind of the aesthetic and who the true crime podcasters are from each documentary to documentary. But this one that came out last year, 2022, it is Tubi's Ted Bundy documentary called Ted Bundy Evil Among Us. And uh, it was okay. Um, I've never seen a bad Ted Bundy documentary. Uh, it, it doesn't tell me who directed it. it. It's only an hour, 25 minutes. It's one part. It was written by Adam Mayer, and it doesn't tell me who did the voiceover either. But, uh, <clears throat> and I, I didn't recognize any of the podcasters that are some of the talking head uh, interviewees, except for Brittany Ransom who's part of the podcast when when killers get caught she was in the sins of the father green river killer one and i i would have to say this one of the three to be originals i've seen so far bundy uh sins of the father green river and jeffrey Dahmer fresh meat this one might be the second best i'd probably put sins of the father green river killer up here then bundy and then the Fresh Meat Jeffrey Dahmer one. Uh, the Fresh Meat Dahmer one just, I thought, was kind of poorly made. There was a lot of uh, <clears throat> historical inaccuracies, both just with the data or the voiceover or some of the interviewees. This didn't really have that. Um, but I would say, you know, it's definitely no conversations with the killer, the Ted Bundy tapes. I would still say this is still my favorite Ted Bundy documentary. This one, it, it kind of just goes over the main events of Bundy's life that we've seen in every documentary. <clears throat> you know, how and where he was born, his family, you know, the lie of his family, of, you know, who his mother is, his sister, his grandparents, moving to Washington, all the universities, uh, meeting Diane Edwards, Liz Klepfer, getting back with Diane and they're going through his murder spree uh his arrest his trials his two escapes his televised Kyle Omega trial uh him being felt guilty then his death and then his sort of serial killer legacy the only thing that's different is this one might have a bit more emphasis on kind of what created Bundy like where did his obsessions and dark fantasies start so I thought that was kind of interesting, but even that has kind of been talked to, or talked about to death in a number of different documentaries. Uh, which that's another thing about these two B originals is they kind of try to add some sort of psychological angle to it to see where these killers came from. Now, I would say none of them were done as well as Reels, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, Killer Cannibal. That one. That's a really well-made uh, sort of psycho uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, psychoanalysis, excuse me, uh, look at a serial killer, Again, even though that's all conjecture as well. But this one, yeah, <clears throat> the only way you're going to find any of it somewhat uh, illuminating is if you don't know anything about Bundy to start with or to begin with. Maybe if you've seen a couple of the movies, but not really seen any documentaries prior. Because this one is sort of the most basic and straightforward. <clears throat> I would probably say this one is even more basic and straightforward than, from what I remember, uh, the um, A&E biography one on Ted that I saw years ago. I think that one goes more into his personal life and him than this one does. It does spend a lot of time on the victims. It does still sort of have a, a theme to look for whenever the timeline comes up for showing the victims. <clears throat> it does have 
its own special look to it to help separate it from the other Tubi originals. But all in all, it, uh, other than some of the psychological uh, 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 suggestions, I guess, it doesn't really add anything new. I mean, it's still very interesting. Uh, I've never seen a bad Ted Bundy documentary. But it doesn't really cover anything new. Although, one thing I did notice about these Tubi originals is they do always manage to get at least one or two people from the killer's personal life that hasn't been seen in other documentaries. Kind of get a little bit from them. This does have that. Has a uh, Mary Lynn Chino, who is a friend of Liz Kletfer's. Larry Anderson, who is a friend of Ted's from Salt Lake. <clears throat> But it does have your typical familiar faces like Ken Katsaris, the sheriff from Tallahassee, Kathleen McChesney, who was part of the King County uh, Police and part of the TED Task Force. So it does have some familiar faces that's in every documentary. And it it, it kind of goes through all the main uh, bullet points of Ted's life, all the confirmed victims that we have. But it, it doesn't feel like a full... Uh, psychological analysis of Ted. I mean, it, it does break down sort of where these fantasies could have started, where his anger could have started, and the uh, evolution of his crimes and him sort of showboating as a lawyer during his trial. It, it does go into that, but it's definitely not the most in-depth. I would probably say this is one of the more basic, straightforward ones that I've seen on Bundy. And I've seen a lot of documentaries on him. But it's still by no means bad. It's still worth checking out. you know, Especially if you're fascinated by the case like I am. Uh, this is still probably my number one favorite serial killer case. Always has been. <clears throat> so I'm always going to check out a Ted Bundy documentary. No matter how basic, straightforward sort of for beginners as it might be, which this one is, but not really a whole lot to say on it other than that. So I guess we'll go into the short killer summary and then uh, sort of the list of everything that this covers. I try to make it short, but it's an hour and a half documentary and I find everything interesting. So bear with me on that. And so can still recommend it. Just don't really expect anything new to be uncovered in it. Especially if you've already seen stuff like this and Falling for a Killer. So, so yeah, now we'll get into that. Ted Bundy is considered to be the most notorious serial killer in American history, killing at least 30 women between 1974 and 1978 across seven states in the Pacific Northwest and Florida. He only confessed to 30 just days before his execution on January 24, 1989. We'll never know the true number or the true time of his spree, as there's some speculation of him murdering and at the very least assaulting as early as 1961 at the age of 14. Bundy, known for his good looks, being nicely dressed and charming, preyed on the kindness of his victims, often wearing a cast and a sling on his arm or on his leg and hobbling on crutches and looking as if he was struggling or asking for help. When the victims got to his car, which was a, a Volkswagen Beetle, he would bludgeon them unconscious with a tire iron or a crowbar, put them in the front where there was no passenger seat, and take them to a remote era, area, sexually assault them, and then bludgeon or strangle them to death. He decapitated at least six of them and saved their heads, leaving their corpses for the elements to destroy all evidence. He started out sneaking into the homes of his victims, knocking them out, then abducting them, but as time went on, he got more brazen, even impersonating an officer and abducting one from a Colorado ski resort. And on July 14, 1974, abducted two separate women, Janice Ott and Denise Naslin, four hours apart from the Lake Sammamish State Park in Washington. After an estimated 15 murders, Bundy was pulled over for speeding and his, quote, kit was found in his car leading officers to put him in a lineup for the failed November 8, 1974 abduction of Carol DeRanche. After she identified him, it led to the first of many trials and all states were connecting their Ted murders. Bundy escaped custody twice. First, he jumped 
out of a second story courthouse window on June 7, 1977 and was free for six days and then shimmy through a light fixture in his cell on December 30th, 1977, where he was free for 46 days, made it to Florida, and killed two and wounded two at the Chi Omega sorority house on January 14th, 1978. The same night, he would go six to eight blocks away and brutally attack Karen Chandler, who also survived. On February 9th, he killed 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, he was stopped again on the 15th and was brought back to prison. His murder trial was the first ever to be televised, and he made it a circus, being his, uh, being his own attorney. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. He made several appeals on death row, and in a last-ditch effort to save his life, he confessed to 30 of the murders. He was still executed on January 24, 1989. Aside from his handsome looks, intelligence, and charm, he was also a law student, was active in politics, and dated his longtime girlfriend, Elizabeth Klepfer, for six years, from 1969 uh, up until his arrest. In the years since his death, people have been uh, fascinated by Bundy, in including the FBI, and is a key figure in how profiling and behavioral, sci behavioral analysis w was retooled in the 1980s. Many books, documentaries, and films have been made about Ted. Even nine actors have now portrayed him thus far. And so we'll go into what the documentary actually covers. And uh, the podcasts or podcasters that are featured uh, from True Crime Obsessed, we have Jillian Pensilval and Patrick Hines from Sinisterhood. There's Christy Wallace and Heather McKinney. And When Killers Get Caught is Brittany Ransom which I remember her from the Sins of the Father, Green River Killer uh, documentary. I think her and, I want to say Patrick Hines from True Crime Obsessed, are, are the ones that speak the most. I think they're the ones that kind of carry us through the documentary the most, uh, aside from all the people that's actually part of the Ted Bundy story, like uh, Ken Katsaris, uh, Kathleen McChesney, some of the same people that's been in, a lot of other documentaries and the psychiatrist featured is doctors Judith Joseph and Tristan Engels uh, just so I don't have to put what they say or anything but they're they're all featured prominently uh, throughout the documentary so first it goes into Ted's childhood with Louise being 22 when he was born extremely religious household sent to a home for unwed mothers her father stopped her from putting him up for adoption and you know, took him in, or took them in. Uh, this was in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Stephen Bichot, who wrote uh, Conversations with the Killer and The Only Living Witness, along with Hugh Wainsworth. Uh, he also talks about this. We get photos of him as a baby and a young child, Louise, and their home. It goes into to the possibility that uh, her father, Stephen, uh, that possibly assaulted her and that Ted is the product of that assault, which of course that has never been proven. Uh, the lie of Louise being his sister and the grandparents being his parents. Uh, the abusive man that his grandfather was. How he was seen to be bright but disturbed. It, it tells the story about the aunt that was babysitting him. Fell asleep, woke up with all the knives around her, pointed at her with him just standing there when he was like three or four. How he probably always felt unstable and rejected. Shows photos of him as an older child, in, uh, also in, in the Scouts and in school. Uh, then we go to 1950, when Louise takes Ted to Tacoma, Washington. Uh, met and married an army cook named Johnny Bundy. Uh, the photo of, it shows a photo of him. Goes into how they had four more kids uh, uh, together. Uh, shows family photos, him being a loner in school, not good at sports or fitting in, or being able to connect with other people, uh, his teen interests in pulp and detective magazines. Uh, uh, they were introduced to Kevin Sullivan, who's written, I think, at least six books on Monday. I think I have three or four of them. Uh, he talks quite a bit throughout it. Uh, he goes into this. 
uh, as does Stephen Michaud. Uh, then it goes into uh, how these magazines mixed sex and violence and were found near or with pornography, like at the bookstores and grocery stores, and how this could have helped to develop his sexual deviance, how his dark fantasy started growing around this time. It, in admittance from later in life that he used pot and booze to help numb uh, the fantasies. It goes into his uh, early days of being a peeping Tom. Uh, one night he gave in, walking home drunk. He came up behind a woman, clubbed her, and then ran away. Uh, the theory that this was him testing to see what it was like and if he actually liked it. Uh, graduates high school at 65, shows his graduation photos. Uh, has attendance, oh, his attendance at the University of Puget Sound, uh, the University of Washington, where he first meets Diane Edwards, shows a photo of her, a photo of her that I've never seen, actually. Most documentaries usually use the same couple photos of her, so uh, I was actually surprised to see this one. So then it goes into Diane, uh, her wealthy background, how they met, started dating, how he fell crazy, madly in love, but also he loved status, and she came from a great background, the kind of status that he wanted. Uh, his grades slipped. She saw him as uh, unambitious and dumped him. How this was the blow that uh, the blow that this rejection had on him, <clears throat> and how that could have triggered some kind of vengeance. Uh, 1969, he meets Liz Klepfer. It, it actually calls her Klepfer. Some documentaries will call her Kendall. Some will say Klepfer. Klepfer is her real name. <clears throat> I think Kendall just started as her pen name for which she wrote The Phantom Prince. How they met at a bar. We're introduced to uh, Mary Lynn Chino, who's a former friend. On Ted sitting alone that night with a dark, mysterious look. Uh... But he danced with Liz, and uh, but he oh, but how Liz danced with and left with Ted, I swear the the autocorrect on this I, I really need to start proof anymore. Uh, they start dating, photos of them together, how perfect their relationship was, how he was her prince. <clears throat> um, Ted being shown love like he's never seen. Uh, in 1970, he re-enrolls in the University of Washington to finish his uh, degree in psychology. Uh, using this while working at the suicide hotline in Seattle, uh, Stephen Michaud on Ted telling him he did best when it was a, a woman who called. How saving or taking lives tapped into his sort of God complex. How he worked on the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, uh, what he learns from this, uh, which was how police look into crimes, how jurisdictions don't usually communicate. And in 1973, rolls into law school at Puget Sound, but isn't focusing on school and he's not doing too well. <clears throat> uh, so then January 74, drops out of Puget Sound, says he's too focused on it says he's too focused on his dark urges and is ready to act on them. It very briefly, briefly mentions how he and Diane got back together. He won her over uh, so much so that they talked about getting married. She accepted. And then he just dropped all contact with her. Uh, and then, you know, when she finally got a hold of him and asked him what was up, he said, I don't know what you're talking about, and hung up. And how dumping her was sort of that his way of one-upping her kind of proving to himself that he could have her if he wanted but also that breakup or him finally getting that revenge on Diane is sort of what sparked his spree so very briefly uh, uh, goes into that uh, it actually doesn't mention how they got back together for a period a while with Liz uh, that uh, broke it off by 74 uh, just before his known first attack, which was January 4th of 74 at 12.03 a.m. at the University of Washington, Seattle. It, uh, 
the attack and surviving of Karen Sparks. Shows a photo of her. She was a dance student at University of Washington. How we probably picked her while peeping uh, for a period. He picked up a metal rod that was, uh, I think, a piece of her bed frame. Uh, uh, bludgeons her with it and sexually assaults her with it. Shows a photo of... And this is kind of how they do their timeline or like the photo after each victim and then a timeline at the end. Photo, it says victim number one, name, age, and date. So, uh, <clears throat> it, it says that and how she was in a coma for, which her age was 18. Uh, how she was in a coma for 10 days and suffered brain damage. Uh, I think this is the first time that the psychiatrist, uh, Judith Joseph, comes in. How his whole life had led to that moment, so it's going to be messy. He's finally giving in, and he's going to enjoy it. Uh, he keeps his cool for four weeks, and then goes back to the university. Uh, Kevin Sullivan on the attack of 21-year-old Linda Ann Healy, uh, choking her unconscious. And then it goes into how he's evolving as this kind of predatory criminal. Uh, it's showing his level of intellect and planning uh, by taking off her nightgown, hanging it in the closet, grabbing street clothes, putting those on her, and then uh, making her bed. <clears throat> uh, and then abducting her, driving her an hour away to the Taylor Mountains to rape and kill her. It shows her on the timeline. Uh, and, and then this is, I'm not quite sure why, because it doesn't really uh, uh, distinguish between survived and murdered. Just It just says victim number. So like Karen Sparks, Carol Durange, Kathy Kleiner, Karen Chandler, they're all victim numbers just as the, uh, the uh, murder victims. So, uh, I always thought that kind of threw it off. I, I feel like it could have said survived instead of a victim number, but... Uh, <clears throat> Kathleen McChesney, who, who was at the time a detective of King County, on how Healy was well-known as a radio ski report announcer, so her, her disappearance was noticed. It shows a map of the locations of the first four murders, it goes into the fourth attack, which was Susan Rancourt, Susan Rancourt, excuse me, <clears throat> how, how there were witnesses uh, seeing a good-looking guy with his arm in a sling and wondering if if that was connected uh, to Rancourt. Uh, his M.O. is now luring instead of uh, breaking and entering. He makes himself look weak to appeal to the kindness and vulnerabilities of others. It says, like Linda and Donna before her, Susan is taken to the Taylor Mountains. But Donna Manson hasn't been talked about yet, so I thought that was kind of strange. Uh, how he'd return to her body over and over. Uh, necrophilia being the ultimate form of control and power. Because they can't fight back, they can't say no. And compares that control to when Diane dumped and uh, rejected him. So then he goes to Oregon, feeling Seattle is too hot at the moment. Shows timeline victim number five, uh, uh, Roberta Sparks, which was May 6th of 74. She was 20 years old. Uh, she fell for the man in a cast ruse. How his crimes are ramping up. His victim profile, which every documentary says this. Young, pretty, dark hair parted down the middle. Uh, even mentions how one time Liz wanted to uh, cut her hair and then he freaked out because he didn't want her to change it. It goes into his compartmentalization of student, boyfriend, known to be charming, uh, uh, cooked dinners, liked wine, but then he could be this killer and how that possibly emboldened him knowing he was pulling off this secret and uh, fooling everyone. Kevin Sullivan on Ted trying to uh, bring those sexual desires to Liz, such as anal sex, which she was not into. <clears throat> Spring of 74, five victims in five months. It shows, it shows that graphic uh, 
uh, map again. Uh, it then goes back to Seattle. 22-year-old Brent DeBall leaves the Flame Tavern, starts hitching, fell for the man in the cast routine. Then it shows her on the timeline, which was June 1st of 74. It goes into his careful, meticulous planning, how he just trolled back and forth uh, down an, an alleyway until his intended victim or a random woman stopped to help. Uh, it, it, and, uh, in this particular case, George Ann Hawkins shows a photo of her, uh, Stephen Michaud and Kevin Sullivan on this and how when he struck her with a tire iron, her earrings came off and she came out of uh, one of her shoes. He drives her 15, 20 minutes away, <clears throat> uh, strangles her in the woods, shows her on the timeline, which was June 11th of 74, so just 10 days later, it, and how she was 18 years old. Uh, news footage of her disappearance. And then, I, I don't think I've read this somewhere else, but it mentions how he went back to the scene where she was abducted, where there's police and news personnel everywhere, because he wanted to find the earrings and he actually he finds them and he's able to take them without anybody noticing uh july of 74 talked about how when ted <clears throat> uh pushed liz off the raft and into the cold rough waters of the uh, yakima river and how he wouldn't let her back up on the raft and she claimed that his face was blank it, it supposedly his darkness cracking through the surface and so then this is a date that anyone that's ever read or seen anything on ted bundy knows july 14th 1974 lake sammamish <clears throat> shows the same footage of the festivities of that day goes into how he abducted janice ott and denise naslin for four hours apart from the same place on the same day uh Which, uh, it goes into how he's a textbook psychopath, which uh, I know was the belief for decades, but I thought that if one was a sexual sadist and a narcissist, then they could be a psychopath because those are uh, uh, conflicting uh, things. But whoever the psychiatrist was that was explaining this, this they even list narcissist as like a character trait of psychopath i found that very confusing because yeah i always thought you know they're psychopath and then they're sexual sadist and narcissist where you know you need certain emotions and being able to register pick up on things that psychopaths don't so i always thought that they were two different things uh so it goes into janice ott and then uh, uh denise naslin shows them on the timeline uh, simultaneously uh, <clears throat> and then it goes into how the name Ted was overheard and that people had seen him, so they were able to give a sketch. And this was the first big break in the case, and it, it shows the sketch. Uh, the the disappears, disappearance is linked, and the task force is launched. Kathleen McChesney on joining due to her experience in uh, sex crimes. It goes into the state of feminism or where women were in general in the 1970s and how Ted threatened um, all of that. Shows another news report on Lake Sammamish and how the sketch looked like anyone. Uh, his name was Ted. Uh, it, it, now the Volkswagen is mentioned. It, it didn't mention it at first with the clues from uh, Lake Sammamish. <clears throat> and how in Washington at that time, there were 50,000 uh, registered Beatles. Liz calling police about the sketch, but his background uh, thought him unlikely. Uh, how she found things like a bowl of keys, women's clothes, and plaster of Paris in his apartment. Calls again, but they still don't think it's him. Uh, on top of getting countless tips uh, from jaded girlfriends, uh, they, they don't think it's him because of his background on top of getting a bunch of jaded girlfriends calling in. So they said if, if she's serious and wants to file a report, then she has to go in. 
uh, which she does not. It goes into how if she accepts that Ted is Ted, uh, then their whole relationship would be a lie. Kathleen McChesney on noticing how, how the killing stopped after the summer of 74, but not knowing why. So that, then it goes to August of 74. Ted moves to Utah for law school at in Salt Lake City. We're introduced to a guy named Larry Anderson, who was a former friend, uh, Fred, friend of Ted, uh, on how Ted first joined the Mormon church in Salt Lake City. Uh, also says that that famous photo of Ted washing dishes with a, a blonde uh, female was actually in his house, Larry Anderson's house. Uh, it goes into how well he was able to blend in uh, everywhere in Salt Lake City and make himself look good and normal. Shows the map of Utah with victims 10 and 12 marked. Uh, all in October 74. 10, 11, 12 was all in October of 74. And then the timeline, 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox, which was October 2nd. 17-year-old Melissa Ann Smith, October 18th. 17-year-old Laura Abe, which was on Halloween. So those were the three. Uh, that was in Utah. Larry Anderson on the sketch reaching Utah, and no one thinking it was Ted. Also during a dinner at Ted's house, he told the group, how one could get away with kidnapping and uh, murdering. Uh, so then, this is another date that anyone who's seen multiple things on Monday will know. November 8th of 74, the failed abduction of Carol DeRanche. So, it, it, it goes into her. And then it shows her as victim number 13, although she also is a survivor. <clears throat> uh, so then, the same day... 10, 10 p.m. in Beaumont High in Bountiful, Utah. The abduction of 17-year-old uh, Debbie Kent shows a photo of her. It goes into that. Shows her on the timeline. So technically she'd be 13, not 14. Uh, it, a handcuff key found in the parking lot. They match it, they match it to Durant's handcuffs. Utah now linking the crimes together. Larry Anderson on how he was supposed to go on a ski trip with Ted, but at the last minute, Ted asked if he could go alone just so we could get away for a while, which takes us to January of 75, the Wildwood Inn Resort in Colorado. Uh, Kevin Sullivan on Karen Campbell. That, that's another date that uh, I think everybody can expect throughout any uh, documentary. Uh, <clears throat> how Karen Campbell was a nurse from... Uh, uh, Michigan, who was there with her fiancé and two kids, shows a photo of her. Uh, it, it mentions and shows through the uh, dramatization how she fell for the man on crutches act and helped him to his car, which I always read that she went back, she, she was going to go back to her room from the lobby to get a magazine, and people saw her get on the elevator I never saw her come back. So sometime between her ele the uh, elevator stop and her room is where she got abducted. But here, the, the way they describe it in the dramatization, it makes it sound like she helped him to his car. Uh, shows her on the timeline. So now under uh, 1975, because it goes by year as well, uh, number 15, which was 14, on January 12th, she was 23. Uh, how she was found a month later. Julie Cunningham shows a photo of her. How she was going to meet friends at a bar in Vail, Colorado. Uh, again, the uh, man on crutches. Timeline uh, it says 16, but I guess she'd be 15. March 15th, she was 26 years old. How Ted kept up appearances in Utah, whether it be school, friends, politicians. Uh, it, sorry, the thing came in weird. Uh, it even calls him like a near shapeshifter. Uh, but now expands his hunting to um, Idaho. May 6th of 75 in uh, Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, Lynette Culver shows a photo of her. At that point, his youngest victim, she was 12 years old. Dr. Judith Joseph on... 
how younger victims are easier to fool, trick, they're, they're naive, therefore easier uh, uh, to fool, I guess. Which, <clears throat> it, uh, I don't think it had anything to do with sexual preference. In fact, I know it had nothing to do with sexual preference because I've read a ton of books <laughs> on him. So he did go after her after sexual preference of her being 12. It was like the psychiatrist said. It's because the, the opportunity, where she was, how she was easier to trick and overpower. <clears throat> it, it was more of the uh, of opportunity and stuff like that, rather than a sexual preference. And that's not opinion, that is objective. So any anyone that disagrees is wrong. It, it's the same with the Hillside Stranglers and with their 12 and 14 year old victims. It wasn't because of preference, it was because... They wanted a victim and they were available. So, uh, of opportunity can some a lot of times overrides the uh, sexual preference. But shows her on the timeline, which was May 6th of 75. Uh, then Susan Curtis in Salt Lake City, July 27th of 75. She was 15. It the, This part of the documentary does get kind of repetitive because it is it, it goes from one victim to another. Which, that's kind of all we know. But instead of, like, his life and stuff like that, it, it just kind of goes from one victim uh, to the next. <clears throat> uh, August 16th, 75. Uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, which, that's another date everyone knows where he got pulled over. The officer was searching his car, found his kit, and uh, arrested him. Uh, shows photos of that. His arrest, it shows his first mugshot, which is the one where he has, like, the longer hair, the black sweater. Utah officers think he may be Ted. Larry Anderson on when Ted called him as his one phone call and did believe him and tried to say that they made a mistake and he would not do this. Uh, the search of his apartment, photos of his apartment, how they found brochures of ski resorts and the programs of the play where Debbie Kent was at her school. Although, when they say Debbie Kent, it shows a picture of Lynette Culver. Uh, <clears throat> and also, gas receipts placing him in the areas of some of the abductions, such as Karen uh, Campbell. Larry, on how he visited him shortly after, and asked if there's any possibility that he did this. And he vaguely admits, if I did, this is how uh, uh, I would do it. And from that point on, he dropped all contact. His $50,000 bond, it'd be under investigation. Kathleen McChesney on reaching out to Liz to learn more and how she helped. It shows the lineup for Carol Durant, uh, uh with the uh, photo. It says how she pointed him out immediately. But I've also read in other sources that she kind of struggled to point him out because during the abduction, he had a mustache and before the lineup, he shaved and combed his hair differently. Uh, Ted selling his Volkswagen, but they were able to track it down. They searched it and found hairs from three victims from three different states. So no way they would know each other. Uh, and that also helps connect uh, 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 all the states. <clears throat> uh, Larry Anderson on finding this out and becoming convinced that Ted is a killer. And then it goes directly from there right to his first escape, which was June 7th of 77. It says on the screen, Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen. Uh, Ted's first escape from the courthouse second story window goes into that. Uh, he was already found guilty in the Durage case. Uh, this whole part of the documentary like breezes through. Uh, he escapes. He's caught again. Uh, uh, photos and footage of the courthouse. Free for six days. Stole a car. Pulled over. And then arrested again. Uh, then it goes directly from that to December 30th of 77. Uh, Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. His, his uh, second escape. Uh, uh mentions how it was through a, a broken light fixture 
it, it gets a hacksaw blade, cuts it open, loses 30 pounds so he can shimmy through. Mentions how it was between Christmas and New Year's, so most guards were gone. Uh, it shows footage of his cell, the hole in the ceiling. Uh, go back to Mary Lynn Chino on the fear of him coming back to Salt Lake City. Uh, shows the graphic map showing his travels after his escape from Colorado to Chicago, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Atlanta, and then finally Tallahassee by January 8th. Then it goes directly to January 15th of 78, Kyle Omega Sorority House. So it goes into that, shows a photo of Margaret Bowman and Elisa Levy, uh, bludgeons them, that strangles them, and sexually assaults Levy. Shows them on the timeline simultaneously. Uh, 18, uh, 19 is Bowman. She was 21. 20 is Levy. She was 20. Then attacks Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler. Shows them on the timeline. Though they uh, survive. A passing car scares him off. How this attack is full Ted. Like and now he's full frenzy. There's nothing to hold him back. Then we're introduced to Ken Katsaris, a former sheriff of Tallahassee. And from what I've gathered, he's in like a lot of Ted documentaries. He seems to be like Ted Bunny's arch rival. He seems to be the one that they've had the most kind of like cat and mouse. Which I was surprised because it doesn't have the, uh, of I'll plead not guilty right now of, of footage or, or any of that. Or really Ken Katsaris talking about how he got the teeth molds made and the back and forth between them on that. Uh, but Ken Katsaris on how Tallahassee had had a major murder investigation since 1966. How Nina Neary saw the attacker, attacker flee the house. It makes it look like she had been hiding when in reality she had just come home and they uh, passed each other. <clears throat> um... Uh, a photo of her on the stand, uh, how he has gone from being uh, meticulously planned, calculated, uh, with no evidence or witnesses, to sloppy, rage-filled attacks. Then it goes into the attack of Cheryl Thomas that same night, uh, a few blocks away. She survives. Photo of her on the stand. And of her window that he came through, along with uh, some evidence that was found. So we go to February 9th of 78 in Lake, at Lake City Junior High, which was 100 miles away from Tallahassee. The abduction of 12-year-old Kimberly Le Leach shows a photo of her. How we lured her away, possibly due to not being able to lure, uh, you know, of age, uh, uh, excuse me, not being able to lure uh, older women away the same way that he used to be. Or be uh, used to be able to, excuse me, shows her on the timeline. Only she's credited as or listed as victim number 24. But as far as like murder victims go, I think she'd be number 20. Uh, one of the podcasters calls it pedophilia. And again, I do uh, disagree with that. Pedophilia is the attraction to children. Uh, there's a psychological difference. When the perpetrator is opportunistic, as it's not based on the attraction, but what they can get away with. And again, that's objective. That's not opinion. <clears throat> February 15th, 78, 1 a.m. Uh, his, uh, his last pullover, stolen VW, uh, when, when, when arrested, he fought back, but was subdued. It goes into that. Uh, they ran the plates and saw it came from the same area as Kai Omega. Now he's a suspect. Uh, he wouldn't give his ID, but they were able to match uh, his prints and saw that he's Ted Bundy. <clears throat> Doesn't really go into the uh, <clears throat> Florida mystery man, which all of this was because he, he went quite a bit or quite a while with not giving his identity. And it became a big story. So it doesn't really go into that that much. Uh, uh, saw that he's Ted Bundy, one of the FBI's top ten, which it shows that poster. Ken Katsaris on the special steel-lined cell he was placed in, and the rule about there being three locks, 
with three keys, uh, one of which given to three different officers. And if at any point one officer had all three keys, then they'd be fired. <clears throat> um, and then it shows uh, footage of that special cell. Ted reaching out to Liz has audio of the call between Liz and the investigators from February 21st, 78, about his call to her. June 79, Kyle Mega trial begins in Miami. We're introduced to John Henry Brown, former attorney of Ted Bundy. On, uh, he talks about the plea deal. He's also written a book about uh, being the attorney for people like Ted Bundy and a few others. So it goes into the plea deal. Uh, if he confesses, there's no death penalty, and his uh, uh, refusal, or no death penalty, but he'd be given 75 years. Uh, it goes into his uh, refusal, and uh, the two psychiatrists on the idea of how he refused and is his own attorney is his way of uh, knowing he'll never get to kill again, maintaining some sort of control, power wanting to maintain the image of himself that he wants and to see how far he can keep uh what he wants going uh of course it uh, uh i actually was surprised at how little this this part of the documentary it goes into because this part this topic usually goes really in depth in a lot of the bunny docs i've seen but the fact that it's the first televised uh, a murder trial it, it kind of just says it's the first uh, nationally televised trial it doesn't really go that deep into it so by that i was surprised and it, it got that kind of done and over with which i thought was nice uh tons of footage of the behind the scenes and the courtroom proceedings how 250 news outlets from five continents were there ted relishing in the spotlight and getting to play lawyer uh, he had other lawyers, but he had to be the lead attorney uh, out of control and to show he's smarter and how he used it as a stage to flaunt himself. <clears throat> uh, him calling witnesses uh, shows footage of Cheryl Thomas being questioned by him. We're introduced to Bob Deckel, the former uh, assistant state attorney, on how Ted asked the uh, resounding... I don't know what word that's supposed to be again. This autocorrect, I, I really need to uh, proofread these more. Responding. The responding officer repeatedly to describe the Chi Omega scene in explicit detail. It shows footage of this. Officer Oscar Brandon. Uh, footage of Nina Neary pointing to Ted while on the stand and her sketch drawing. Uh, the bite mark evidence on Lisa Levy. Uh, photos of the double bite mark, Ted's teeth and molds, and how this was... Uh, the smoking gun evidence, July 24th, 79, verdict read, after five hours of deliberation, he's found guilty. Pre-sentence hearing, he attempts to prove that Dur to Durange that she was abducted by someone else, but she doesn't back down. Footage of his, uh, no sound, just video, oh, it, it shows footage of that, uh, but... It's no sound, just video and voiceover narration. Uh, he's felt guilty, uh, Larry Anderson, again, on how when you have a close friend that you trust and support, uh, then find out they're a killer, that feeling doesn't go away. He's 73 and still feels it, still talks about it, or still thinks about it. How he confessed to 30, but experts believe it to be much more, and he showed no remorse. January 23rd. 1989, Florida uh, State Prison, uh, Stark, Florida. Uh, it, how he exhausted all appeals in 10 years, uh, according to a guard. Uh, according to a guard the night before, he seemed somber. He sat and cried, uh, refused his last meal, called his mother twice. Footage of his cell and the death chamber. Uh, the next day, he's executed by electric chair. Footage of the burn, Bundy burn crowds outside. Uh, ends with two psychiatrists talking about how he was not the typical kind of serial killer that was around in the 70s. Uh, and not the kind of person people wanted to believe was a killer. And his 
uh, manipulative talent and charm uh, ends with a shot of the his Glenwood interview when he smiles. So that is Ted Bundy, Evil Among Us, the to be original. I mean, it's it's no, it's definitely no conversations with the killer. Again, I'd say this is probably the, the most in depth. Uh, there really wasn't much that I found to be. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Illuminated. Uh, again, it's getting to the point where if you've read as many books as I have, seen as many documentaries as I have, uh, it's going to be hard to find something that will shed some light on stuff. Uh, I, I still think this is the most informative, but again, that's not really the documentary's fault. Uh, I would say this one was much better than Tubi's uh, Dahmer documentary. Uh, I would probably say it's similar or about the same as the Sins of the Father Green River Killer uh, documentary. Except I would say this one has more of the kind of basic, straightforward, kind of run-of-the-mill Ted Bundy documentary. So, I mean, if you're someone that doesn't really know a whole lot about Bundy, I would find this to be a very good sort of beginner's uh, documentary. It, it would be a good place to start. It, it really breaks down all the essential uh, events in Ted Bundy's life and really just kind of breaks down all the known victims uh, that we have. It doesn't really go super in-depth. You know, uh, I would say Conversations with the Killer and Falling for a Killer, the uh, Liz Kletford documentary, those two were very informative. But, yeah, I, I would kind of consider this a straightforward, kind of beginner's basic kind of documentary but by no means boring uh I, I, this one didn't really have any uh i would say historical inaccuracies like the dauber one did uh it had a lot of similar faces of some other uh, buddy docs but it, it's still definitely worth checking out again you might only find it illuminating or uh a, a revealing if you don't really know much about Bundy going into it but still fairly solid still decent it just it doesn't really have anything new to it and is kind of a beginner's documentary so uh, that is again Tubi's uh, Ted Bundy documentary there's a few more on Tubi that I'll be checking out um, in fact uh, uh, there's at least one more Ted Bundy one that I'll be checking out uh, at least right off uh, and then there's going to be some of some killers that I haven't talked about at all that I'm very excited to get to. So stay tuned for those, and uh, thank you for watching.